Um, getting underway. First and foremost, for the Zoom folks, please use the chat feature to ask questions. Evan will kind of monitor those and feed them to me. And at the end of the session, if something didn't get answered, just feel free to email or call me and I'll be happy to answer them as we're going forward. One big thing we need you to do, if you hadn't done it already, your team info, get that contact info for your team that's listed on the ASA website. If that's blank right now or you have missing info, you need to update that as soon as possible. That's how we all get in touch with each other. And one of the big things I'm going to talk about tonight is going to handle communication. It is such a crucial part of what we do as a league, as swim teams, as coordinators. All this interaction between team to team, from league to team, from coach to swimmer, coach to parent, coordinator to parent, all this really kind of lends itself to either setting yourselves up for a smooth set of organized chaos or just absolute uncontrolled chaos. Controlled chaos is manageable somewhat. But if we can't get in touch with each other, we can't do anything. And the big cornerstone of that is if you have no info list for your team, how does the other team get in touch with you and work out the details of your upcoming swim meet? How do you plan as a coach to know, hey, how deep is that pool? On the turn in, are we going to be pushing off from the wall? Or are we going to start from the block? We're going to start from in the water. You know, these are important details to know. And having that information updated is really, really important. So make sure you follow the steps that are listed here. It's pretty easy to follow. There are links. And I'll send out a recap of this with all the live links in it. You can't really click on this if you're here in person. Okay. Meets. Communication, like I was saying, is crucial on a lot of fronts. Between the teams, before every meet, in fact, this should be taking place now. Don't wait till the week of. You hopefully have been in contact with the other five teams you're swimming this year on a rudimentary level. Just say, hey, look, just touching base, making sure we're all on the same page. You know, if you know any particulars about your pool, the setup that you need to let them know about early, great. But bare minimum, at least two to three days before the meet swims, the home team needs to reach out to the visiting team and get really important details ironed out. What are you planning on getting here? What's the plan for warm-ups? Where are we going to sit? Do you have any concession policies that are a little bit different than, you know, what people are used to? We have a couple of country clubs in the league that are a little bit more restrictive about letting people bring in outside food. So knowing that in advance is kind of important. When are we going to do lineup exchange? Okay. Is the 3 p.m. deadline that the league lays out not going to work for you? Well, let's set a time that we all agree on in advance to go, okay, this is how we're going to deal with this. Also talk about, hey, look at the weather a couple of days out. It's not always accurate, but if they're forecasting heavy storms on Thursday night, talking on Monday about, hey, what do we want to do if we hit bad weather? That's kind of important. If you have that conversation on Monday, it makes Thursday a whole lot easier. But if you try to do that on the fly when a thunderstorm pops up out of nowhere and you got people scrambling all over the place to get off the pool deck, that does not lend itself to a very happy outcome. Okay? Talk about things like, hey, if we're going to reschedule, what's workable? What's available for your pool? What's available for your coordinators and your coaches and your swimmers? Because you may pick a date, and if you're trying to do it that night, you're not going to be able to talk to everybody and go, hey, what is your schedule? Oh, by the way, we didn't realize when we picked to swim on Wednesday night instead that half the team's gone. All the coaches are out of town. The coordinators are gone. The home team's concession person isn't there. That's probably not a real good situation. But if you're trying to make that decision on the fly, it doesn't work. But if you had the conversation on Monday, three days before the meet, well, gosh, it gets a lot easier. Talk about things like, hey, if we do hit bad weather, how long do we want to wait? The rule book says essentially you can take one delay of about 15 to 30 minutes. And if you're not restarted after that, you get one more delay of 15 to 30 minutes. And then you've got to make a decision. Either call the meet 
reschedule the meet, or you know, you can prolong the delay, but that's got to be mutually agreed upon by the teams. That's not a discussion you want to have in the middle of a crowd, in the middle of a thunderstorm. That's also something you can communicate to your parents. Hey, look, we've already talked about this. This is exactly how long we're going to wait. It'll avoid the mass exodus that happens during most rainouts where the rumor mill gets started. Hey, I heard we're gone. We're done. We're finished. We're out of here. No. If you walk in there and say, look, we are waiting until 7 o'clock. And if we don't get started by 7 o'clock, then fine. We'll make a call then. But it'll avoid people at 6.30 going, hey, hey, let's go. Let's go. Let's go home. Okay? Teams really struggle with that. And if you just handle the communication side of it, it works much better. Communication with your families. The more information you can give them, the more you're setting them up to be successful and the more you are taking the workload off of your shoulders. Practice schedules, meet schedules, warm-up times, arrival times, volunteer assignments, all that good stuff. What the kids are swimming. Okay, you've got access to a lot of resources in Swimtopia and Meet Maestro to generate reports that you can send to parents and say, here's a heat sheet. Here's everything your kid's swimming. You take the Sharpie and write the event heat and lane on their arm. Don't burden, you know, three parents and two assistant coaches with having to do that. It'll save a lot of extra work on your side. But if you're not sending this info out and sharing this info, again, you're creating more work and more challenges for yourselves. Additionally, the more you can frankly keep track of stuff like this, when you get that parent that's not always easy to work with, if you've got a stack of emails that goes, look, you were told to be here at this time, at this place, and here are four emails that I sent you. I don't like to stand on to sit there and chirp at you about that, okay? But again, there's really no way to over-communicate in these cases. So again, Swimtopia has good resources to help you guys send out emails, mass texts, and things like that. So use them to your advantage. Communication with your referee, and we'll talk about referees a couple of times tonight. But first and foremost, all of your meets will have a, an ASA scheduled meet referee sent to you. We'll communicate that schedule three to four days in advance of the meet. You'll get that in an email with a schedule, tell you who the person is, their email and their phone number. It's the responsibility of the home team, once they get that info, to communicate with the ref and confirm that they're going to be there. Call them, email them, text them, do whatever you do until you hear back from them. Yeah, got it. I'll see you on Tuesday night. I'll see you on Thursday night. Talk to them about other important details like, oh, by the way, we're going to save you a parking spot. If you're capable of doing that, your ref will really appreciate it. More importantly, the ref is not going to get there at 4 o'clock like everybody else does. And they're going to have to walk like half a mile in 95-degree weather. And they're going to get there probably about 30 minutes before the meet starts. And if they're running late because of traffic, you may hold up the start of the meet because that person's having to walk from Timbuktu to get to your pool because you didn't just put a cone out and save the space for them. Okay? Coaches, again, when you have coaches at the meet, when the ref gets to the meet, they should talk to the meet ref, introduce themselves, notify the referee, hey, who do I tell about DQs? Because the referee will not tell the swimmer. They're going to tell the coach or somebody the coach designates to keep track of DQs, okay? That's important, again, that they communicate and interface. Communicate with your neighborhood and your HOA. You're going to bring a lot of people to your pool. An open line of communication with them and setting some expectations and understanding what they expect from you and what you expect from them will avoid a lot of conflict. The HOAs have become really aggressive over the last four or five years. They're not always swim team friendly. I don't know why, because you are the best thing they got going. I don't know anything else that an HOA does that gets almost every family with children involved in something in your neighborhood. And more importantly, it's a great program to help sell houses in your neighborhood. It's an attractive thing. 
but they freak out because some empty nester who just wants to do some lap swimming at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning is just going to go completely ballistic because all those awful children are in there swimming and making noise. Well, sorry. But also, look, this goes back to your communication. Parking is a big deal. Okay, make sure people know not to block driveways. And if there are particular, you know, houses that are nearby the pool, get them clued in, get them on your side. Okay, okay. Uh, next slide, meets. It's kind of what we're here for. We're gonna talk about swim meets. Competition is, you know, it's, we, we, we are a competitive swim league. We keep score. We hand out different colored ribbons for different places. But it's not the end all be all of why we're doing this. I, I keep going back to the same thing I start almost every meeting with. We're here to have kids get involved in our sport at mm -hmm. grassroots and fun introductory level. Okay. We want them to get the benefits of what every youth mm -hmm. sport offers. Things like goal setting, teamwork, fair play, hard work, you know, working towards, you know, enjoying things. And if they get real good at it, great. But we're not going to create a, you know, community full of Michael Phelps and Katie Ledecky's. It just, you know, it ain't going to happen. Okay. More often than not, a lot of these kids, it's going to be like where they end up. But the idea is get them in the door when they're five, six years old and keep them in the door till they're 18. Okay. But the only way we do that is by keeping this fun, approachable, enjoyable. Okay. Swim meets are a really big undertaking. And again, I'm not trying to scare you here because I know we got some newbies in here. But it's a lot of people and a lot of moving parts and a lot of different age groups and a lot of different personalities. Just like everything else in life, everything is not always going to go according to plan. No matter how much effort or, you know, planning you put into it, something will work the way you expect it to. And there are a lot of things you can't control. You've got to walk into this with that understanding. And you've got to keep in perspective, let's keep this fun and enjoyable. Okay. Again, communicate with your opposing team to work out details. Map out a plan for the day of the meet. When you're going to get all this stuff done. There's a, you know, a good timeline on this on when stuff generally gets done. Have that mapped out. If, you, if you've got like a day job, which guess what? I bet almost all of you have one of those. Okay. If you've got to do that, you got to learn to delegate and move stuff around to be able to make sure all those boxes get checked on your to-do list. So you can walk into that meet at 5.30 or 6 o'clock and get started on time. Make sure your volunteers know what their jobs are and what their responsibilities are. And this can be as simple as taking some of the literature we've included here or the league rule book and copying and pasting things of descriptions of what a timer does, what a place judge does, okay, and giving them a heads up. Just a simple paragraph can equip them to walk into stuff and kind of know what they're doing. Communicate to your team, your lineup as early as possible, okay? Once that meet gets merged and put together and you know what heat lane everybody's going to be in, get a heat sheet out. Get that check, entry uh, check-in sheet out that lists kids event by event or lists the kids by name and lists all the events are swimming, the heats and lanes that they're in, okay? Help is always a phone call or email away. I go back to the same thing that I started the meeting with. I am here to help you. Nothing will drive me crazier than having you guys struggle with the meat. And the first thing I'm going to ask you when you finally call me up is going to be, when did you know you were having problems? And then I almost always will get up. Well, I didn't want to bother you. You're not going to bother me. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you. I'm here to make sure your meats hopefully go relatively smoothly. But I can't read minds. Okay. And in a lot of cases, the stuff that we'll start to talk about if you struggle is stuff that a 20 minute phone call would have eliminated 90% of the problems you had. Okay. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Next slide, please. Just an overview of the stuff we're going to cover and where you can find the details on this in your rule book. The required stuff and the job requirements and job descriptions are on pages six through eight of the league rule book. The meet referees covered on pages three, seven, and 13. That covers their responsibilities, what they get paid, and what their expectations are. The general rules that govern the league are covered on pages nine through 17. 
specifically lineup exchange, which is a big component of this. It's covered on pages 11 and 12. And that timeline that I talked about, when stuff's got to get done, is covered on pages 18 through 20. Next slide, Evan, please. Meet referees. So, as I mentioned earlier, we will schedule your refs for all of your meets. Okay, I will send that schedule out several days in advance of the meet via email. It is the home team's responsibility to be in touch with that person no later than 24 hours before the meet. But as soon as that thing's in your hands, you can reach out right then and there. Okay, ideally, I try and get the subsequent week's referee schedule out by Friday of that prior week. Okay, if not Friday, you'll be in your hot little hands by Saturday. Okay. But if you can't get in touch with that ref, and you've tried calling, texting, emailing, whatever, and you hadn't heard back from them, by 6 o'clock the night before your meet, give me a call or drop an email or give me a text. Say, hey, by the way, I've been trying to get in touch with this person. I have not heard back from them. I will intervene and either find out if they're coming or not. And if they're not, I will get a sub. I'll find somebody. What I do not need you to do is four o'clock on Thursday, you know, I never did hear from the ref. Well, if you call me at that point, unless one of you has got a helicopter to come pick this person up, the odds of me finding you a sub are like nil. It's not going to happen. If you let me know the night before, I'll make sure we get somebody there. Okay. Home team should confirm the night before. If you're unable to do so, like I said, let me know. The cost of the referee is $100 per meet. It's split evenly between the two teams, $50 a piece. Tipping is okay. This will sound kind of silly that you're going to tip a referee, but it's one person in charge of an event with a couple hundred swimmers that's going to go for three and a half hours in 95-degree weather. If they do a really good job, keep things moving, there's nothing wrong with throwing an extra 10 or 20 bucks out of the concession stand money. Okay. However, don't walk up at the first, you know, start of the meet and pull one of those things from Caddyshack, if you've ever seen that maybe, where he walks up with a 50 fold up his hand, go keep it there. Yeah. Be discreet. Okay. Save them a parking space. I told you that. If they're running late, and occasionally they will be, Atlanta traffic is back. It's normal again, unfortunately. Every once in a while, they're going to have car trouble, whatever else, or, you know. I've had people get food poisoning in the middle of the day. If they're running late, hopefully they're going to communicate with you and give you a heads up. But if you know they're not going to be there till 6.30, don't wait till 6.30 to start the meet. Have the coaches get together and either they can split up the responsibilities themselves or you can designate a parent with some officiating experience to step in and get the meet going, okay?
Okay, the, the, the turnover is, you know, it, it's grinding away the more we go. But they're going to get it right, you know, in the high 90 percentile of the time. But if they don't, again, accidents happen. Mistakes happen. Okay, just watch Major League Baseball these days. Okay. Uh, next slide, Evan. Stuff you need to run a meet, page six. Starting blocks if your pool's deep enough. Chairs behind the blocks, that helps to keep kids organized. Sometimes that's practical, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can run in situations where it just is, you just don't have a lot of deck space and chairs just kind of get in the way. That's a pool by pool situation. Backstroke flags, you obviously need those. Lane ropes, common sense. Lane markers, it helps to have like laminated sheets above the lanes in some area behind the lane, high enough where you can see which lane is which, okay? These short people, they really can't see what's going on. But if there's a big sign, you know, behind lane one, since hey, this is lane one, not lane six, that just helps keep people organized. Some sort of PA system. That can be something as simple as a bullhorn. But if you have a, you know, a regular PA, that helps to have your announcer be able to, you know, speak to people, tell them what's going on in swim meet. I'll talk about announcers in a few minutes. Worst case scenario, you can get a really good bullhorn on Amazon. There's a company called Pyle, P-Y-L-E. They make great bullhorn with a detachable thing, detachable microphone. Works out great. They're like 30, 40 bucks. They're cheap. They're great to have. Starting signal. A lot more teams are using these electronic start systems from either Colorado or Omega. They work great. Plus, they got their own internal, you know, speaker and amplifier, along with the flash for the strobe and a nice loud beep. Those are ideal, but they cost 800 bucks. So that's not in the budget. You need to make sure you have some sort of start signal available for the referee. They should have a whistle on hand. They've got to use it. If you got some way to do it, that'll help. Stopwatches. Again, Amazon is your friend. Buy, just get like 10 of them. They're, they're fairly cheap these days. Okay. And I don't want to say the disposable, but you can probably get about two years use out of them. You can get a set of 10 for like 40 bucks. But make sure you've got enough to cover your team and the visiting team just in case. Okay. You kind of get what you pay for. If you want to spend money on nicer watches, that's great. They'll last longer, they're a little bit more durable, but stopwatches grow legs. I'm just going to tell you that. They disappear. Clipboards, go to Office Depot, go to, you know, Go to Sam's, Costco, pick up, you know, a dozen of them. They'll come in handy. All right. Table for scoring. Your some type of meet management software, your computer. Remember, you need internet access to make all this stuff go. So if you don't have Wi-Fi at your pool, you need to arrange for a hotspot, whether it's somebody's phone or a, one of those individual hotspots you can buy from your wireless carrier. Your computer equipment. Laptop printer and your general office supplies as well. The other big thing here is the visiting team should bring their computer stuff to take your computer, take your printer, take paper to your away meets for two reasons. One, it's a backup in case the home team stuff doesn't work. Two, all this stuff is networked now. Y'all could split up the duties. And most importantly, the visiting team can print their own heat sheets. They can print all the paperwork they need and want for the meet and don't have to bog down the home team or burn up a ream of paper and half a ton of cartridge because they didn't print any heat sheets for their families. The visiting team should never walk into a meet and go, hey, can you give us 50 heat sheets? No, it doesn't work that way. However, if you ask for one or two, you know, three or four, that's not a problem. You ought to be accommodating for that as the home team. Any questions about the stuff you need? Next slide, people. You need lots and lots of people to run swim meets. Again, a quick synopsis of all the people you need and who supplies them is on page six. And I'm gonna talk in great detail about what these people do in just a sec. Two deck managers, one from each team. An announcer, the home team provides that person. Starter referee, the league's gonna send that person. Two place judges, one from each team. Timers, two per lane, and you're going to time your lanes, okay? 
One judge is recorder. That's provided by the home team. Two master recorders, one from each team. A runner, that's a home team only person. Two computer operators, one from your team, one from their team. And two ribbon workers, one from each team. So what do all these people do and what do all these jobs mean? Before I get to that, I'm going to talk about the home team checklist, the stuff you need to do before the meet. I talked about confirming with the ref. The home team is going to provide all of the computer equipment. Computer, printer, paper, office supplies, labels. Okay, again, the visiting team should bring their stuff just in case. The home team is going to set up the pool by having all the paperwork printed for the meet, the operational heat sheets that are needed, the place judges forms, the timer sheets for all the lanes, not just their lanes. Okay. They're going to provide water for all the meat workers. I couldn't believe this, but a couple of years ago, I had the team call me up and go, hey, it was 98 degrees yesterday, and we were to swim meat, and the home team had a person walking around handing out water to all the meat workers from their team. They provided no water, nothing, for any of the visiting team's meat workers, the meat referee, or anybody. I'm like, uh-uh. Case of water costs $4 at Costco, guys. Take care of those people. Home team will call, text, or email the final score of the meet into me when the meet's done. That night, not the next morning, not after they've gone to the Mexican restaurant and had a pitcher of margaritas. That happened. Okay? And when you communicate the score, I need to know the neighborhood names. I don't need nicknames. Because if you do that, the Sharks are going to beat the Sharks. Okay, I don't know which team has got the orcas or the, you know, the crocs or whatever else. They're like a dozen of every mascot that's aquatically inclined that you can imagine. Let me know the neighborhood names and the, and the score, the night of the meet. For all the younger people out there, this, there's this thing called voicemail. If you call and somebody talks, but they're not there, and then there's a beep, talk after the beep and tell me. Key jobs for a meet, pages seven and eight. This is the place where you can kind of copy and paste. If you want to put this in your team handbook, there's a crib sheet for your parents. The announcer provided by the home team. In general, their main job is to let everybody know what event we're swimming, what event needs to go to the blocks, and nachos are now on sale at the concession stand. That's it. We do not need a running commentary or play-by-play. -play. We don't need this person who thinks they're the most charming, funny, witty person to give their commentary on life at that point because they're going to end up being the most obnoxious, crass, hurtful person that's going to make your neighborhood just look like a bunch of bores. Okay? Keep it simple. Don't talk over the ref. They have no role in telling the swimmers any of the commands as to what they're going to do. They never utter the words, take your mark. Okay? That's the referee's job. Their main job is events one, two, and three need to go to the blocks. Okay. Occasionally announce the score maybe. Okay. If you want to play music at the meets, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but it should not interfere with the ability of the swimmers to hear the meet referee. Okay. It shouldn't drown out everything that's going on. All right. Timers. Two per lane. This is really a big one. If you want to get your meat done while it's still light outside, it's really important you have two timers in each lane. Here's what they do. Both timers will be from the same team. One person has a stopwatch. One person has a clipboard. The person with a stopwatch, their only job is to start the watch when the race starts, stop the watch when the swimmer touches the wall at the end. Tell the time to the person with the clipboard. Clear their watch, move on to the next race. That is the only function of the person with the stopwatch. And there's one stopwatch per lane, not two. Okay? The person with the clipboard, their job is to write the time down that's given to them in a large and legible fashion and communicate with the recorder that's going to come by and get the times after every race. 
That's their primary job. They may help check the kid's name when they get out of the water, but they'll let the person with the stopwatch focus on doing their simple job, which is start the watch, stop the watch, tell the time, clear the watch. If you do that, the referee can start. When, once the last swimmer touches the wall, the next race can start in about 10 seconds. If the same person, if you have one person trying to do this job, which is start the watch, stop the watch, write the time down, tell the person with this, that's going to take 20 or 30 seconds. No joke. 10 seconds per race. There are 80 events in an ASA meet, usually about 100 heats if you throw in the exhibition. 100 times 10 is 1,000 seconds. That's like 20 minutes. Who wants to get the swimming done 20 minutes sooner? Any takers? I bet everybody does. Okay? It's crucial to have two people do this job. And I know it's tough getting parents to volunteer, but again, Parents want to gripe about how long the swim meet takes? Volunteer, show up, do, help us out. You make this meet go real fast, okay? Really important that you have two per lane, okay? Any questions about that? Awesome. Deck manager. This is what some other people might call a clerk of course. Their main job, and there's one from each team, they're like the last line of defense to box. A couple of heats before that, heat is going to go on the blocks they're just going to go by lane by lane and double check the swimmers names make sure the right kid is going to get the right lane and the right heat they're not there to get them organized and bring them over there that's bullpen they do that job their job is just double check right a heat or so before they get on the blocks right kids in the right lane and you check your own kids that's why there's one from each team the home team's not going to recognize the visiting team's kids it's highly unlikely Okay, so again, real important, one from each team. This person needs to be organized. They need to be good in a chaotic, stressful environment with a lot of people coming up to them, asking a lot of questions. Okay. There's a balance point, though, here. Real good, real organized, type A personality. A plus will scare the living fire out of every child. I've heard the stories. Great deck manager. Not a single kid got in the wrong lane. 20 kids quit the swim team because they are terrified of Mrs. Smith. She's a little too efficient at her job. School teacher is a real good person for this job. They're used to dealing with just gaggles of kids and herding cats. Okay? So real important. Personality types fit certain jobs. Place judges, one per team. Steve's be somebody with some good swimming experience, understands what to look for. Their only job is to sit there and watch the finish of each race, watch the swimmers touch the wall, and write down the order of finishes they see it on their heat sheet. They'll write it down, four, six, three, two. Lane four was first. Lane six was second. Lane three was third. They'll write it down in that logical order that most brains process info. And they just write it on a heat sheet, okay? And then they're going to compare notes with the other person. One from the home team, one from the visiting team. One vote per team, nice and even. Okay? Don't verbally call it out. They try and verbally call it out. That immediately lends itself to, well, they were kind of emphatic when they said four. It's not a discussion. It's not a negotiation. It's what you saw and then what you wrote down. It's that simple. If they disagree, then they consult the starter referee. Hey, what was the order of finish in event 32 in heat one? And ask them immediately. Don't let them start the next race till you get their attention and let them figure it out. If they can't break the tie, then the place is a tie. It's that simple. It gets, to, you know, into the computer, gets split up points-wise. Both kids get the same place ribbon. We move on. We don't consult the stopwatches for times. We don't look at video. We don't ask the judge's recorder who's sitting there. They don't have a vote. It's write it down, compare notes. If you don't agree, stronger referee breaks the tie. If they can't break the tie, the spot's a tie. That process is pretty simple in my book, but teams will foul it up on occasion. Try and avoid doing that. Yes. The home team's going to pick up the extra line. Yep. Because they'll have more, more parents available. Great question. So, again, 
odd number of lanes in a pool, the home team's going to pick up that extra lane for timing. Key jobs for me continued. Place judge continued. If you're in an eight-lane pool, we're going to bring on an extra place judge just because it's a lot of stuff to process and write down. The one and one, the one from the home team, the one from the visiting team, they're going to cover places one through four. That's the three scoring places plus an extra spot. So if they disagree, you got the, the extra spot to go to. Places five through eight will be covered by the home team's going to provide an extra place judge, and they're just going to provide, they're just going to, you know, they're going to judge places five through eight. Okay. Any questions on how that works? And that's only in an eight-lane pool. Judges recorder. This person sits with the place judges. I normally tell teams, put them behind the place judge. Don't put them next to them. Here's why. That immediately tells them, you're not here to be a place judge. You're here as a clerk. Their job is specifically just write down what the two place judges agreed upon on the place judges form itself. It's going to make its way around the computer operator. Okay? They have no vote. I joke the perfect person for this is a person who has lost the power of speech. <laughs> they can't talk. So unless they're going to start tapping people and going, oh, they have no vote in this. Make sure they understand that. It's only there to record the official order of finish as the place judges saw it, okay? Once they do that, they're going to hand that form off to what we call the master recorder. One thing to note, and there you can, I've got sample forms in the league rule book. On these, I'm sorry I didn't put them in this. The place judges form, there are two spots to record the order of finish. One across the top of the form, which you can write it in logical order. That's the way that it's going to come out of most people's brains. First place was lane four, so lane four gets listed first. Lane three was second. Lane three gets listed second. Lane five was third. They get listed third. So it would be four, three, five, whatever, all the way down to sixth place or however many lanes of pool is. They're going to then transpose that into the vertical columns, into the lanes, and assign it there. If they try to, like, logically – go straight to you. I'm going to put it in the lanes. They'll make mistakes. Guaranteed. People's brains don't work that way. And if they do, man, they're real smart. And they're real organized. But I, I'm yet to see anybody that can effectively do that without making mistakes. Write it twice. Write it across the top and then write it vertically. Transpose it. That way we have a good, solid record of if there were mistakes made, we can go, okay, well, look, logically it's here. This might have been a transposition error. Any questions on that job? All right, runner. This is an optional job, and it tied. Yeah, your question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I need. I skipped master recorder. That's on me. Master recorder. I'll talk about that first. If you still got a question, I'll let you know. Um, master recorder. So when the place judges get done, they they've given the order finish to the judges recorder. They filled that out. That piece of paper goes over to what we call a master recorder. One from each team. This is somebody needs to be in good shape. They're going to walk, no joke. The average person will cover at least 10,000 steps in a meet if they work the whole meet. Okay? Somebody that's got, that's very goal-oriented, wants to make that fitment go ding, be the person for this job. They're going to go from lane to lane, and they're going to write down the actual time of the swimmer for that lane into the spot for that swimmer, okay? Just go literally lane by lane, lane one times 1522, lane two times 1523, and so on. And then they're going to take that form over to the computer table, okay? Ideally, if you've got an extra parent that wants to help, that's a good place to put them. The more parents you can get involved in this, the faster this paperwork makes its way around the deck. And one thing to note, the place judges forms, when they get printed, they'll print two to a page. I strongly advise teams, cut them in half and stack them up in order. And here's why. One race, one piece of paper, it's real hard to make a mistake. And 
put the wrong race onto the wrong piece of paper. But if you have two races on a sheet of paper, your odds of getting something crossed up and writing it in the wrong place go up. If you got one job, one heat, one race, and you're walking around that deck with a clipboard going, all right, I got to get a mid-15 heat one. You can get that. That's pretty straightforward. Okay. Try to work it that way. You still got a question? So good question. So if you've got electronic timing and you're using Dolphin or Time Drops or Wireless or Peachtree Timing is coming in, running Omega equipment. If you've got that, you do not have to record the times because they're going to electronically be transmitted to your Swimtopia software. So you can bypass that job altogether, okay? So if you have electronic timing, it's a real big benefit. It ain't cheap, but it's worth it, okay? Good question. All right, moving over. Runner, as I was saying, runner only comes into play if your computer operators are like really far away from the pool deck. It's just not practical for the master recorder to loop that into their circuit, okay? The runner can help just frankly move paper back and forth from the deck into the computer people in a quick and orderly fashion. The other big thing is try to get people to avoid hoarding the paperwork. Don't let people stack up like eight races and then come drop them in there and go, here you go, because they'll be out of order, okay? They might get dropped. You might get one lost. That's not good, okay? Get done. Make it just part of your route. Drop that piece of paper off, okay? But if you need to, again, move across a big distance, home team's going to provide that person. Computer operators, one from each team. We did the Meet Maestro training this past weekend. That was recorded, and we got a good recap. And also, I'm coming up with a nice, quick resource guide that I'm going to put out next week as well. But bottom line, each team has a computer operator that they're going to provide during the meet. Now, two people really can't sit at the same computer and do this. Okay? Now, actually, now that this is networked, they could have two computers running, and one person could do the boys' events, the other person could do the girls' events. Or, again, there are a lot of different ways to, to work through this. But at the end of the day, this should be a shared role. And if you just want to use one computer, that's fine. But the pers one person may be inputting times. The other person should be sitting there trying to help organize the paperwork. Make sure the events are in order. Look for situations like DQs. Look for situations where the timers and the judges didn't agree. That has to be overridden in the computer. Okay, share the duties. No team should ever walk in there and go, we're the only people that can use the computer. It doesn't work that way. This is open access for both teams. There are no state secrets on the computer. Awards, ribbon peelers is what I call them. Peel, stick, drop. This can be done a hundred different ways. Some teams actually wait till the meet's done. They'll print all the labels out and just take the ribbons home and sit there and watch. You know, Grace and I to be drinking a glass of wine doing this job. My wife did that. Okay. But again, the award labels should be printed throughout the meet, though. If a team wants them done then, and they got parents there, they're going to do it. It should be available and eligible. But again, communicate how you want to do this. All right. Bullpen, it's not really listed in the rule book. And that's because every team has a different way of doing this. A lot of this stuff boils down to real simply how your pool's configured, how your team's organized. Most teams in general will have one parent in charge of one group. You know, the 35-year-old dad is in charge of the complete lunatics that are the six and under boys. And they'll have like a special T-shirt, a hat, an apron, whatever, to identify themselves. Their job is to kind of corral the kids, get them to the blocks, get them somewhat lined up and ready to go in a timely fashion. Several events in advance of when they're going to swim. But there's a sweet spot. Don't get them there too early. It just causes crowding behind the blocks. Any questions so far? Those are the jobs. And the personality types, like I said, every role's got a, you know, a fit. Just in general, the less experienced parents tend to be real good for things like awards, 
the really highly experienced parents ought to be your timers, your deck managers, your place judges. And then the other in-betweens are like runners and other things. Computer operators kind of a specialized job. The big thing with computer operators, I'll tell teams, always have somebody in training for the pipeline. Okay, you get a question? Sure. No, so you you will not need to do any of your place judges sheets during the meet if you have electronic timing. The only time you're going to have to consult, you do need a place judge as backup in case the timing system fails, and you do need a runner on hand in case you got to get a backup time or something like that. If that equipment operates correctly, you should be able to operate without, frankly, the need of a master recorder, a judge's recorder, a runner. Um, you know, like I said, you only need one place judge. And again, the only time you would have to consult with them would be as if there's an error or a malfunction of timing equipment. All right, moving on. Timeline for a swim meet. When stuff happens, how it happens. So this is on pages 18 through 20 of the rule book. The first step in all this is a line of exchange. So the day before the meet by 3 p.m., Teams are supposed to have their lineups completed and uploaded into Swintopia and marked as ready for exchange, okay? Teams can agree to do this a little bit later. It's not a problem, but it needs to be mutually agreed upon. It needs to be communicated in advance. I advise not doing this any later than 6 p.m. the night before me. The home team from there has to merge the meet. The visiting team can't do it. This it's the way Swintopia is set up. If you're having issues with this, with a merge, let me know. With my administrative capabilities, I think I can merge the meet for you if need be. Hopefully, I won't have to do that. Okay? The meet ought to be merged by 10 o'clock the night before the meet. But honestly, once a line of exchange takes place, it's a pretty quick process. Somebody ought to be able to sit down in a matter of about five or 10 minutes, put the meet together. Okay, the only adjustments that now have to be made because we're using this new platform, you want to go in and if you've got an opportunity to combine some events, you'll do that. But there's no more having to go back, what we used to call meet consolidation, which took 20 or 30 minutes. You don't have to import anything. Everything's just kind of put together for you. You click a button and everything just kind of gels together and they fill all the available lanes, it works out great. But the one thing you'll have to manually do though, if you do want to combine events, so for example, 13, 14 boys, 13, 14 girls, there are a total of three relays between two teams in both genders. Well, you can only swim one heat. Put the girls in lanes two and three, put the boys in lane five, you got an empty lane in between just in case. You manually move that stuff around, and then it's ready to swim. You just communicate with each other, hey, we're going to combine these two. But it has to manually be done. That's the only adjustment that's got to be made. But the meet ought to be merged pretty soon after the line of exchange. But bare minimum, don't do it any later than 10 o'clock at night. I get it. People may not have access to computers or things like that. It may not be practical for the home team to be able to do this exactly when the line of exchange takes place. But bare minimum, when you lay your head on that pillow at night, you ought to have a meet that's put together. You ought to be able to print all the heat sheets, check-in forms, everything else you would need to communicate to your parents that night, hey, here's what's going on tomorrow during the swim meet, okay? If you're having issues either with line of exchange or with meet merge, contact me. Contact the other team first, obviously, but if they, you just can't get in touch with anybody, then bring me into the loop. And I'll intervene where I can. Once you've got the meet merged, double check the other team's entrance. Go through, use that meet check-in sheet to make sure that the other team does not have an illegal lineup. And if they do, that's not a phone call to me. That's a phone call to the other team, to their coach. Hey, I think you made a mistake. You need to fix this. If they don't fix it, they refuse to fix it, and it's an obvious rules violation, then it's a call to me. And I'll step in where I need to. 
But otherwise, you ought to be able to work together to sort this out, make the adjustments that need to be made. You may have to remerge the meat, but it's a pretty straightforward deal. Timeline, continue, substitutions. So once you've done the lineup and you've exchanged the other team, you're not allowed to make changes to the individual events, okay? Except for the following, legal substitutions are for situations where a swimmer that you've entered is unable to be at the meet now, okay? So you did the entries, you merged the meet, you go to practice the next morning and the moms are over there in the corner and they're talking. Oh, Billy was all, all night throwing up, he's not going to the meet. Jimmy fell out of a tree. Sally got tickets to a concert. Joey got arrested last night. Isn't going to make bail. Take your pick. You're going to have people that will let you down. They swore they're going to be at the meet. You put them in the lineup. They're not there. They've moved. They're never coming back. I've seen that happen. Okay. You can fill in for those people. You can fill the holes that are created by them. Those are what we call legal substitutions. And for details on that, that's covered in pages 11 and 12 in the rule book. I'm not going to beat that over the head. But ultimately, the big thing about substitutions are this can be done up to 30 minutes before the beat starts. Okay? Once you get to that 30-minute deadline, no more changes. Okay? As, as far as the individual events go. Relay changes, you can change people on the relay anytime you want. But the individual events, they need to be managed and dealt with and in the computer by 30 minutes before the meet starts. That does not mean they all take place right at 30 minutes before the meet starts. This ought to be an ongoing conversation throughout the day with the other team. Get on the phone at noon after practice and you've had an hour to digest who's not going to be there and you've gone ahead and filled in for who won't be there. And each team can go into Meet Maestro and input those changes themselves, okay? But communicate, send a list, just as a courtesy to the other team. These people are out. This person is in, okay? Do it again at 2, maybe 3 o'clock before you're going to pack up and take everything over to the pool. Hey, these people are out. These people are in. Again, each team can input these changes if they want to, or they can say, look, the home team's going to manage all these. Whichever you guys want to do, you have the flexibility to do it. So when you get to the pool, the only substitutions you're dealing with at that point are the kids that you've been trying to get in touch with them. They weren't at practice that day. You've been trying to call them all day. You're not sure if they're going to be there. They swore they were going to be there. They marked when they did their sign up that they're going to be there at the meet but you hadn't seen them all day. You can't get anybody on the phone. Who knows? Okay. You're only mopping up a handful at that point. But if you try and do them all like 30 minutes, an hour before the meet starts, you're going to run out of time. Okay. Get these done as an ongoing process throughout the day. Again, communicate. Text, phone call, email, any means of communication. This is who I took out. This is who I put in. Okay. Printing paperwork. So you're going to print roughly about four different forms for most meets. Obviously, a heat sheet. That tells you who's in what heat, what lane, and what event. You're going to print that check-in sheet that lists each kid on the team and all the events are swimming the heats and lanes that they're in. You're going to print timer worksheets, and you're going to print place judges forms. Some of these forms, you're going to have to print revisions of for key people in the meet, like a heat sheet, okay? But some of these forms you can print the night before or the day of the meet, depending on what your availability or your computer person's availability is like that day. If you got all the time in the world that day, do it the day of the meet. But if you've got a day job and you're not going to get to the pool till 4 o'clock, don't try and print everything right at 4. You're going to run out of time. You could print a heat sheet the night before the meet. If you want to have copies on hand or sell them at the meet if you want to, you can do that. They don't have all the substitutions in them, but it's 90% accurate. You could print the timers worksheets the day before the meet. Again, that gets back into the amount of time you've got, but the timer sheets have to be printed, stacked, stapled, put on a clipboard with a time with a stopwatch and a pencil. Okay. 
not something you just magic out of the printer and it's right where it needs to be. The big one you'll want to print early is to place judges form. That is going to be like 80 or 90 pages of paper. It has to be cut in half and stacked up in order. Not something you can print just right there before the meet starts. You're going to run out of time if you try and do that. There's a way to print just select events. So you made changes in event 14, event 26, event 28, event 33. You can print just those events for those forms. Okay. But some of the stuff you could print kind of early on. Right. The stuff you got to print, revise stuff with all the substitutions in it. So after you made the last substitution, you're going to print a minimum of at least about a dozen to 15 heat sheets. And I'd advise print them on colored paper. They're readily visible at that point. It's on that bright neon yellow paper. You know, that's the one that's got all the good stuff in it. The big thing with that one is you need about a dozen. And here's who gets the revised heat sheets. The referee, obviously. The announcer. Each deck manager. The place judges, each place judge. That's about six people right there. The other six to 10 heat sheets you're going to print should go split, split evenly between the two teams, probably to go to the coaches or like the key reps. Okay. Those are the people that need to revise. So again, announcer, place judges, deck manager, coaches, referee. Okay. You really probably don't have to print revised timer sheets, but timer sheets are probably something you could print at the pool, maybe around four o'clock. Might not have every last substitution in it, but the timers don't necessarily have to know exactly who's in their lane. They're going to be, they're going to be 99% accurate. If they got one that's different kid, it's not a big deal. They can just write that down. Okay. One other cheat. If you don't want to reprint the judge's forms, you can manually write onto the form the correct kid's name and team. If you want to do it that way, you can do it that way if you don't want to reprint it. Continuing that timeline, like I said, revised paperwork, BYOC or P, bring your own computer or printer. That's real important for the visiting team to do that so you can print all the heat sheets that you want for all the people that you want. But the home computer that's technically going to be running the meet needs to be freed up by the time we get to 5.30 or 6 o'clock when your meet starts. So you're not sitting there waiting for another 20 heat sheets to print before you, before you can work on an event. Pre-meet meetings. So the coaches, like I said, should get together with the ref before the meet, talk about details, who they're going to be notifying for DQs. For the first meet, we give the coaches a little bit of leeway as to how strict the referee is going to be. They need to cover that during that meeting. Ideally, if they can meet together as a group, that's great. That's not always practical. Teams are warming up. may not be easy to get everybody in the same room at the same place. But each coach should at least touch base with the ref for the meet. The ref should meet with your timers and your place judges before the meet to make sure they understand their duties. If the ref's running late, you as coordinators can help do that job. Just making sure everybody's on the same page. The ref should introduce themselves to you, the team reps. You're paying them. Kind of important to know. Ideally, the refs would love to get cash, but they'll take Venmo in a lot of cases. Again, when you talk to them and touch base with them, ask them, hey, by the way, I can pay with a check. I can pay with this. But the ref gets paid on the spot that night at the meet. We don't mail checks. We don't have somebody from your HOA management company, contact them with a W-2. That doesn't happen. They're independent contractors. They get paid their 50 bucks from your team that night. Uh, start the meet. About 10 minutes before the meet starts, the announcer should say, hey, let's get the first three events to the box. Do all your prelim preliminary stuff. You want to play the national anthem, do whatever you want to do. Get all that stuff done. So by the time we hit 5.30 or 6 o'clock, that race is starting. Most meets should be done in about three to three and a half hours. The two biggest teams in the league swim almost every year, and they get done before nine o'clock. 
Now, they have the advantage in some cases, some nights they're in a six-lane pool, some nights they're in an eight-lane pool. But they get done, more often than not, around 9 o'clock. That's two big teams. That's like 200-plus kids per team. Average team in the league's got about 125 kids on it. By the time you get to meet three or four, these things ought to be getting done, you know, by 8.30, 8.45. Now, if you hit a rain delay, that's not going to happen. Meets one and two, you're going to be shaking the rust off. Things aren't always going to go as we plan. So if it runs a little bit late, not a big deal. But if your meets are taken to like 9.30 or 10 o'clock, something's not right. You're either you either got some significant inefficiencies or you're breaking the league participation rules and putting kids in too many events. Okay, the, the league participation rules are designed to give kids ample opportunity to swim, but not to swim every single event, every single meet. Okay. Keep an eye on that. Post meet, home team communicates the score to the league office. That can be anybody. It can be a head coach, it can be an assistant coach, it can be a parent. I don't care who it is. Somebody from your team needs to let me know what the score of that meet was. Any questions about the timeline? We're doing great, guys. I've got a great diagram that kind of lays out a pool real quick, identifies all the workers and where they are. So if you look, you've got these little, what looks like stopwatches. They're behind the blocks, two per lane. Now that's two stopwatches. That's not supposed to be two watches. Those are just markers for time. Swimmers are list lined up. You got the referee right here. You got your place judges here. And you got your judges recorder right here. Okay. If you look, we've also got your master recorders kind of stationed over here near the judges recorder. That's just their loop. They're going to go lane to lane when the race gets done. Circle back, go to the computer table, and they're good to go. Okay. A step-by-step, -step, you know, verbal listing of this. So step one, deck manager from each team checks the right swimmers in the right lanes. Each place judge is going to record the order of finish independently on their copy of the meet program or each sheet, and then compare notes if they agree, and they'll, then they'll communicate it to the judge's recorder. If they disagree, they consult the ref. The ref breaks the tie. The judge's recorders are going to record that order of finish Onto their copy, it's listed as a UK judges placing form. That's a high tech all over. Just the judges form. Judges recorders are then going to hand off that completed sheet to the master recorder, and they're just going to go lane to lane, get the times, and then go to the computer table. The timers again, two people in each lane, one stopwatch, one clipboard, start the watch, stop the watch, tell the time, write the time, give the time. Okay. Each team, again, provides a computer operator. They input the times, score the events, print the labels, rinse and repeat, do it 86 times, and there's a swim meet, okay? Each team, again, provides a ribbon worker to deal with the ribbons however they see fit, okay? Any questions about how that general flow goes? All right, the last you know, big thing that I'll cover is bad weather. If you hit bad weather, this again goes back to that early in the week conversation. Every team needs to have a plan for what you're going to do if you hit bad weather. Where does everybody go? If you have a big clubhouse somebody can just run into and they're safe. Most pools don't have that. They might be lucky if they have a pump room and that's it. Then everybody needs to go back to their cars. Okay. Is your street lined by big old growth trees that don't do real well in thunderstorms? Maybe they go to their cars and drive the car a mile down the road to the public shopping center and wait in the parking lot. Okay, But have a plan. Have some general communicated idea. Hey, if they tell us to get off the deck in two minutes, where do we go? What do we do? Okay, Have that sorted out well in advance and communicate with each other how you're going to deal with this. Look at the weather a couple of days in advance. Hopefully it's not an issue. I'm going to tell you, at least two weeks during the season are going to hit some kind of weather. Maybe on a Thursday, maybe on a Tuesday. I don't know. But if I told you it wasn't going to rain, I'd be lying. 
Okay, I've never seen it happen. And the one time I jokingly said it would never happen, it rained like every week. Okay, but have a plan as to what you're going to do. How, in that conversation earlier in the week, how long do you want to wait? If you can't agree as to how long you're going to wait, the rule book tells you real specifically on pages 15 and 16, this is how long we're going to wait. And if we can't agree as to how much longer we're going to wait, the rule book steps in and says you got about another 15 or 30 minutes, then we're going to move on to step two, which is we either reschedule the meet, we call the meet with somebody either winning or losing based on how many events you've slumped, or we call the meet a tie, it's called a weather tie, both teams get a win in the standings. You hadn't done enough events. One team's not enough ahead by enough points or whatever. You've got that option to, frankly, get out of Dodge. It's the best get out of jail free car going. Okay. The other big option is now we figured this out virtual meets. You can do it virtually and complete the rest of the events at your pool and their pool and then swap results. But again, have a game plan for this well in advance. Don't try and do this the day of the meet, it will end poorly your first concern for bad weather should not be oh my gosh we gotta get the swim meet done we gotta sell a lot of stuff in the concession stand uh -uh. your first thought is how do i get all these people to safety that is concern one two three and four then figure out what we're going to do with the swim meet if you hadn't done it already in advance of the meet okay just quick reminders about lightning safety if you see it or hear it lightning or thunder it's 30 minutes out of the pool. The clock restarts every time you see it or hear it again. It doesn't add on another, you know, if you hear lightning twice in five minutes, it doesn't mean you wait an hour. It means you just wait another 30 minutes after the last time you heard or saw lightning or thunder, okay? Thunder and lightning in that order, okay? If you reschedule the meet, grab your ref. Hey, what are you doing tomorrow night? Can you work us with me? They're your first option for a replacement for your next meet. If they're unavailable, that is an immediate, hey, Frankie, we need somebody. I tell the refs to tell me, but they don't always do it. You as the teams that are involved have a vested interest in making sure you have a referee. I've had it happen occasionally. We'll have teams call me up on like a Wednesday. Hey, we got a meet. And I'm like, really? Well, we rescheduled. The refs said they couldn't be here. And I'm like, yeah. Did anybody tell me? No, well, sorry, you don't have a rep, okay? But if you tell me Tuesday night, hey, we're swimming tomorrow night, can we get a rep? I'll get one for you. Any questions about bad weather? That's, guys, I'm gonna tell you, that one, understand that process up and down and in your sleep. It, it's the one place where teams tend to have a little bit of friction. And it's because one team will be a little more gung-ho about, we gotta get the meet in. And one team will be like, I'm not waiting around for four hours in a thunderstorm and I can't come back tomorrow. I got a day job and half the swim team is going to be gone. I always tell teams, you can't make another swim, swim team show up if they don't want to be there. Okay. Be reasonable, be constructive. It's all a collaborative effort. Other stuff, your feedback is really important. Okay. I need to know the good, the bad, what works, what doesn't work. If you have a great experience with the team, let me know. I like highlighting that. We like rewarding those teams. That's how we select our sportsmanship award winner. If you have a bad experience, you know, a team that's a little bit too competitive, a little bit over the top, a little bit disorganized, it's not, I'm not expecting you to rat out every last small detail about somebody. It's not an open griping session. But if a team really kind of needs some help, let me know. I'll step in and gently nudge them in the right direction if your feedback didn't help, okay? And I know people don't like confrontation. Let me be the bad guy in that situation. But I need to know. I can't be all places at all times. I try to get stuff from the refs, but they're not, they don't always know what's going on behind the scenes, okay? And what they think might be a well-organized meet might be a complete chaotic mess, okay? But I need to know. A simple email, a phone call, whatever else helps me. I need feedback on your officials, okay? If they're doing a great job or doing a poor job and need some help, let me know. If they, you never want to see that person again, I can make that happen. 
okay? But if you're like, hey, I love this person, they're great, I'll try and get them back to you as well. Okay, hopefully we'll get more of the second one and less of the first one. But again, every once in a while, we get a newbie. Uh, I'll send out a weekly newsletter, hopefully by Friday morning. It'll give you a recap of the scores for the week and just some general, I'll take that feedback that you guys give me and distill it down into some good talking points and some learning opportunities for everybody. That gets emailed out. If you're not getting emails from me, add yourself at Swintopia as a designated team rep, the ASA team rep, one of those link roles, a coach or a computer person. That gets you on the list. And you'll get sick of my emails, trust me, especially come championship time. Keep the lines of communication open. I keep going back to that, but it really pays off. Again, we are all in this together. When you think you've got everything put together and everything's running great for you and other teams struggling, don't sit there and use that as an opportunity to pick on them. Use it as an opportunity to help them. You may have been in that very same situation a year before as a new team, or you may be a new coordinator and having somebody help you out instead of beat you over the head with, you're just doing this all wrong. You know, the pat on the back tends to get better results. Again, I don't think, I'm pretty sure, anybody here getting paid for this? No, you're volunteers and you're helping your communities out. You're doing something great for your, for your neighborhoods and your kids. So try and be collaborative, be helpful. We've built a pretty good culture here. We want to keep this going and keep it fun. Have fun, for God's sake. It's summer league, okay? If you can't have fun in a summer league meet with a bunch of kids getting together as a neighbor in the community, there's something wrong with you. Don't mess that up. It's one of the good things we still got going on in the world. Kids sports, I think swimming, we've still, we haven't drifted off into the dark places that some other sports have. We're competitive at times, but we're not this uber win at all cost type. We're still trying to keep this fun and enjoyable which is why you see your team sizes as big as they are. It's why you see swimming being such a popular sport in this country. It's because kids want to be involved with it. It's a good experience. we got to hold on to that and hug it as hard as we can. I've covered a lot of stuff. I hope it's been helpful. If y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to stick around. Um, don't forget your ribbons. You came here to get those. I know that. So make sure you leave with your box. And again. Good luck. Have fun. I am always a phone call or email away. And I answer that phone late at night and early in the morning. Okay. Only time I might not do it is probably on a Friday afternoon because I'm probably playing golf. That's about the only time you'll get me to put the phone down for a few hours. But otherwise, especially on like a Monday night before Tuesday meet at like 1030 and you're struggling, call. I'll talk you off the ledge. Okay. And call me in like the first 30 minutes, not four hours when you're like halfway through a bottle of wine and in tears in the corner, okay? I see some smiling faces that might've been to that dark place before, okay? Thank y'all again so much for the great work you do. Again, best of luck. Good night.